Good evening, and welcome to our Monday Thursday worship service tonight. My name is Eric Taylor. I'm blessed to serve as the pastor here at Trinity Church United Methodist, and it is good to be with you in this Holy Week, this week of so many mixed emotions and mixed experiences and drama and quiet and loud and pretty much everything that you can think of seems to happen during Holy Week, and it's good to be with you in this journey. Uh, for those that are worshiping with us online this evening, I invite you to, to find some communion elements that you might be able to use. We will be um, partaking in the Sacrament of Communion this evening. Uh, bread, grape juice is, is fantastic, but if you have other elements at home that you would like to use, uh, whatever you might have on your table this evening is exactly what God is going to use to speak grace to our souls this evening. As we do begin this worship service, um, the upper room where the disciples have their Last Supper is an interesting place where um, so many things, so many unexpected things come to light for the disciples. And so as we come into this service, I invite you to embrace the unexpected. Not necessarily from this service. This service might be something very similar to you've done, you've done in the past. But God seems to stir in us in the unexpected places. So as we gather tonight, if your mind starts wandering someplace that you wonder why, let it go. See where God leads you tonight and approach all of this with the humility that God asks us as we wash one another's feet. And we're not going to be engaging in a foot washing service tonight, but wherever that unexpected place happens to be, I invite you to journey with God to that place. So at this time, I would like to invite Darianne to lead us in our opening liturgy. Please stand as you feel comfortable and join me in our opening prayer. Holy One, you who lay a table of blessing before us, you have heard us and have come to us. We lift up the cup of salvation and praise. We break open and share our love. Open us this night to your presence in our gardens of delight and sorrow, in the simple and good enough moments that fill our days. Amen. Let us now join with Mike and one another as we sing our first song, Come Share the Lord. The words for this song are printed on the screen or found on the black hymnal on page 2269. Take the bread, come drink the wine, 
come share the Lord. You may be seated. Our first scripture reading for tonight comes from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 1 through 17 and 31 through 35. Before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his time had come to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them fully. Jesus and his disciples were sharing the evening meal. The devil had already provoked Judas, Simon Isserit's son, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew the Father had given everything into his hands and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the table and took off his robes. Picking up a linen towel, he tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a wash basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he was wearing. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You don't understand what I'm doing now, but you will understand later. No, Peter said, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, Unless I wash you, you won't have a place with me. Simon Peter said, Lord, not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus responded, Those who have bathed need only to have their feet washed because they are completely clean. You disciples are clean, but not every one of you. He knew who would betray him. That's why he said, not every one of you is clean. After he washed the disciples' feet, he put on his robes and returned to his place at the table. He said to them, do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you speak correctly because I am. If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you too must wash each other's feet. I have given you an example. Just as I have done, you also must do. I assure you, servants aren't greater than their master, nor are those who are sent greater than the one who sent them. Since you know these things, you will be happy if you do them. When Judas was gone, Jesus said, Now the human one has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify the human one in himself and will glorify him immediately. Little children, I'm with you for a little while longer. You will look for me, but just as I told the Jewish leaders, I also tell you now, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, love each other. Just as I have loved you, so you also must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Darian. I remember back in high school, I was accepted into the Advanced Placement Calculus course. And I have to say, I wore this as a badge of honor. I was one of those weird kids that liked math. Still do, actually. But many times, I miss the straightforward nature of math. I miss putting some numbers together in a certain way and being able to calculate everything out. And most importantly, I miss being able to circle an answer at the end of it and say, is this right or wrong? There was so much that was precise 
when it comes to, to mathematics. And there is so very little that is precise when it comes to ministry. For that matter, Jesus rarely did anything that had an answer that you could just circle it and call it good. Math was fun for me, and my math teacher for calculus was one of the best teachers I have ever had. He had this wonderful way of making calculus approachable, and dare I say, even fun, even for those that didn't like math. But I have to admit that no matter how fun the class was, I struggled with it mightily for a while. You see, I knew my algebra, I knew my geometry, but when I put the two of them together, it proved to be a little bit more difficult than I cared to admit. You see, calculus is this wonderful blending that happens of that. It's like if I took the colors red and yellow, but in my desire to keep things neat and organized, I could not figure out how to make orange. So when the midterm came, I got the lowest grade I have ever received on any assignment or test in school ever. Thankfully, the entire class struggled with it, and the curve was so drastic that I came out with a solid D minus. But let's be real here, I failed, and I failed hard. I received eight points out of 50, and that includes partial credit for where my answer may have been wrong, but at least my work was partially correct. Now let me say that again, eight out of 50, that is a 16% on my midterm. Now usually 60 was the mark that you started to fail, a 16% still came out with a good old D minus. So, uh, of course, a little defeated, I went to talk to my teacher about this to find out if I should drop the class, something that I had never even considered before, but the friend next to me that got a 9 out of 50 decided that he was going to drop the course, uh, so that way his GPA wouldn't tank. So I went to the teacher and said, Mr. V, should I be dropping this? Should I be moving on to, to something different? And he looked at me very straightly and said, no. Instead, I want you to come see me once a week until we get this all figured out. Now, he suggested that I try a few more practice problems than just what was assigned in the homework and to come and see him every week. And if I really applied myself, he had no doubt that I would get it. Now, in my desire to get it right, as my GPA was now on the line here, I went back to the basics, perhaps more so than I had ever done before. I made flashcards that very night and did them every night from then on out. I stopped asking why I needed to do the algebra to a certain point and then geometry from that point forward, and I focused more on just the process to memorize the steps that I needed to do for each one of the different problems that I would encounter. And in addition, as was suggested, I went to see my teacher every week as he asked. And after a while, I started to get more right than wrong. I realized that I needed a change in my perspective to let my metaphorical colors mix and let the boundaries get a little bit more permeable, to let my algebra and geometry play together in the mathematical sandbox that was calculus. And that shift in perspective made all the difference in the world. I know it's weird to talk about calculus as we come to our Monday, Thursday worship service, so let me cut right to the chase. On this night, Jesus asks his disciples to shift their perspective, to shift their understanding of leadership from one of being served to one of serving to authentically put love at the heart of everything they do. Even if that means washing feet, my goodness, washing feet was a servant's job, but even if that meant washing feet before the communal meal. You see, shifting perspectives can be a very challenging thing to do. Take a look at Peter, for example, the seeming spokesperson for the disciples, or at least the one who always seems to open his mouth first, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. But I always like it because it assures us that the disciples did not always have it figured out. 
as Jesus bends down to wash Peter's feet, he refuses and tells Peter, or tells Jesus, that I, I can't do this. I should be washing your feet. And Jesus retorts by saying, Peter, if you don't let me do this, you have no part of me. This is crucial for being a disciple. Now, Peter wants so desperately to be that perfect follower of Jesus that he switches instantaneously to the extreme opposite end of the spectrum and says, well, if that's the case, Jesus, give me an entire bath. You see, this is where Jesus starts talking about the shift in perspective. Peter is focusing on the literal washing of feet. He's thinking that if he gets his feet washed, then you know how to participate in Jesus' ministry, but if you get your whole body washed, then you must be fully immersed in this ministry. But Jesus kind of steers the conversation a little differently and says this isn't about cleanliness. This is about humble service of recognizing that love is not a status symbol. Therefore, discipleship is not about the status. It's not about the fame of who you follow or how good of a disciple you are. It's not a competition to see who can get there first. Following Jesus is about love made known, and that love is oftentimes expressed through humble service. Now, humility is something that often takes Peter a little time to come to grips with. He wants to be the first one to follow Jesus, the first to jump out of the boat, the first to build a dwelling for Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. As we'll see on Sunday, he needs to be the first one in the tomb to see what's going on. Now, it's not that Peter was trying to be pompous. He was just so eager to be part of Jesus' ministry that he focused on the tangibles. He focused on the answers that he could circle. And he said, Jesus, if this is what it takes, then yes, give me more of that. And Jesus is trying to say, Peter, slow down. This is about a shift in perspective. Not about getting the right answer, not about doing the right thing necessarily, but this is about humility. A perspective which moves us to serve one another and ask for help from one another, a perspective which invites us to the table with one another, even those who may have questionable intent, like Judas that very night. Now, perhaps I resonate with this passage so much because I, like Peter, appreciate the concrete answers, the ability to circle my answers like so many math problems over the years. I wish discipleship could be boiled down to a, hey, wash feet and you've passed the test. But life is not that neat or clean. And that's why we have been looking at our uh, good enough study throughout our Lenten journey. Looking at these devotions of realizing that life is messy, that discipleship is messy, that when we want to have clear-cut lines, oftentimes they get blurred whether we want them to or not. Life is full of disappointments, stress, and things that we cannot control an uncertain future. And there's no possible way that we can have everything figured out and navigate life perfectly. You see, that's not what Jesus was trying to suggest at the Last Supper because Jesus knew what was coming while the rest of the disciples just hoped that that next great thing was about to happen. There are not enough hours in the day to perfect everything. So Jesus asks us to approach life with humility, to not presume that we know what's going to happen or try to control every outcome, but instead let the Holy Spirit guide us and be thankful that we are in the presence of the Spirit, to be thankful for the companions on the journey that join us around the table, those who we break bread with and share the cup with even at this moment. We don't know what tomorrow will bring, but that should not prevent us from appreciating the community that we are with tonight. Life is messy, and so is discipleship. There are no easy answers. And what might be the best possible solution in one scenario might be the absolute worst approach in another scenario. This is why Jesus invites us into ministry with humility. 
Humility opens our ears to new perspectives and allows us to engage with others authentically. It prevents us from being defensive like Peter when something unexpected happens and ultimately gives us the simple desire to embrace the relationships that we have, no matter how imperfect we may perceive them to be. In a little while, we'll all be invited to come to the communion table, a table that we may feel we have figured out, a table that we have come to think that we know what to expect. You know, we've taken communion many times before. The disciples sat down for their Passover meal with Jesus, figuring they knew what to expect. They have been to the Passover meal before, not realizing that it would be Jesus' last supper not figuring an arrest and betrayal was in the cards, not imagining that Jesus would take on the role of servant. So as we approach the table tonight, I simply ask that you embrace the humility which Jesus asks us, to be open to new possibilities and direction, to let the Holy Spirit guide you in removing those neat and clean boundaries between red and yellow that we may have grown comfortable with whatever boundaries those may be in your life. Let us come to the table tonight with an open heart, with a humble spirit, and with our Lord. And if I may, let me conclude this sermon with a blessing from Kate Bowler and Jessica Ritchie, entitled, A Blessing for When You Don't Feel, Hashtag Blessed. Blessed are you when you strip away all the extra, when you see the world as it really is, broken, tender, fragile, beautiful. These are the same eyes that see God in everything, too. Blessed are you when you take the hard road, the winding one that doesn't opt for a shortcut of, ra of rage and resentment or unkind words, that doesn't pave over the trite niceties, but walks towards peacemaking. For we are God's kids. Blessed are you when you face hardships of all sorts, insults, hurt feelings, lies, and vindictive neighbors. Blessed are you when you work to usher in God's kingdom of love and compassion and justice and forgiveness and peace, even when it's hard. Blessed are we, the imperfect, and don't have it all together. God's beloved. Amen. This time we invite the choir to come forward as we discern in our hearts all that God has placed there and as the choir offers for us the peace, remember.
Thank you, Claire. And so we move to the table where Christ invites us to sit among neighbors, to fellowship with one another, to be with those that we may think that we have known for our entire lives and still are scratching the surface as to who is sitting with us. Please know that in the United Methodist Church, all are welcome at this table. It does not matter if you're a first-time guest here tonight or if this is some place that you have been coming for the past 70, 80, 90 years. Everyone is welcome at this table. You see, this is the table of Christ. And our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us join with Darianne as we confess our sin before God and one another. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now hear these words of assurance. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. That proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite those who are worshiping at home to gather your elements for communion and place them in front of you. And as you do at home, for those of us that are gathered here in the sanctuary, notice the plain nature of these elements. Bread, juice, humble in their own right. And yet in this setting, through the power of the Holy Spirit, these humble elements become a vessel for God's grace to be, to be made love, made real. So I invite you to hold this in your hearts as we join together in the traditional liturgy of the Methodist Church known as the Great Thanksgiving. The holy and living God be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing any time and everywhere to give thanks to you. You created this world full of so much beauty and sorrow and called it good and called it enough. Although we feel lost at times, God, you are ever present. We doubt, resist, turn away, and rage, insistent on our own power to pull us through and yet sure that, you, that we are to blame, making life seem like a confusing paradox. But you are patient, Lord. You are here with us and meet us, reside with us in strange and alienating times, always faithful, always present, in this body and in this body. And so together we proclaim the praise-filled truth of your glory along with all of your saints. Holy, holy God of hosts, heaven and earth sing out your name. Blessed are they who come today and take their place. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. He proclaimed freedom to the bound, justice to the oppressed, grace to the lost, love for the prodigal. Through life and ministry of Jesus, we can, we can imagine and live into a community where all who struggle are taken into loving arms and those who struggle to love are invited into greater compassion. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, take, drink, all of you. 
This is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And so we remember tonight. We offer ourselves tonight. And we proclaim God's time. Christ, Christ has died, died. Yet, yet Christ, Christ is, is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will, will come, come again. once again. We remember, we remember and, and proclaim, proclaim redeeming love. love. Pour out your Holy Spirit in us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and fruit of the vine. Make them be for us the blessing for our days. Love for simple and ordinary lives, fuel for justice in this world. By your Spirit, open us to each other and open this to the world, making us one in you through Christ in the power of your amazing grace. And now, with the confidence of Christ's own church, let us join together in the prayer which Christ invites us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, come thy, thy will be done, done on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our trespasses, trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This evening's communion will be served at the rail. The ushers will dismiss you out of your pew, and then you may choose to either kneel or stand as you feel comfortable at the rail. Pastor Eric will come and deliver the bread to you, and I will come by with the juice. You are to consume the elements when it feels right to you. After everyone at the rail has received communion, Pastor Eric will offer a blessing. When you're ready, you may rise, dispose of your cups into the trash cans on either side of your pew, and then return to your pew for a time of reflection. There are gluten-free elements. If you so choose, just let us know. There's also non-alcoholic grape juice. If you are feeling uncomfortable coming forward to the rail, Delight Leppel is here and she will serve you in the pew. Just give her a little wave and she will come by you. Our table is prepared. Ushers, please come forward. Body of Christ broken for you. 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 Christ broken for you. I'll need to wait, I'm sorry. Body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you. Body of Christ broken for you.
through the simplicity of this meal, may we feel God's grace, and may that grace sustain us in the days to come. Amen. May this meal of grace fill our souls as we move into the next few days, and may God continue to grace us through this meal. Amen.
through these simple symbols, may we feel the real presence of Christ in our souls today and as we go through the days leading up in this week. Let us go in peace. Amen. is for the bread which you have broken. It can be found in the blue hymnal on page 614. Please stand as you feel able and raise our voices in praise. For the bread which you have broken, for the wine which you have poured, for the words which you have spoken, now we give you thanks, O Lord. By this pledge that you do love us, by your gift of peace restored, by your call to heaven above us, hallow all our lives, O Lord. With our sainted ones in glory, seated at the heavenly board, may the church that's waiting for you keep love's eye unbroken, Lord. In your service, Lord, defend us. In our hearts, keep watch and ward. In the world where you have sent us, let your kingdom come, O Lord. Please be seated. We recognize that this is maybe the start or the, I guess, the continuation of our Lenten week journey, but maybe the start of the more heavier days throughout our week. And so we recognize that this Last Supper in the upper room was only one of many events during Jesus' final hours. Tomorrow we will gather again at 6 p.m. to reflect and mourn the events of Good Friday. So as we depart tonight, let us listen to the words of our scripture as we transition from the Last Supper into the Garden of Gethsemane. And after our passage is read, you're invited to stay for as long as you would like for meditation. And when you are ready, we ask that you depart in relative quiet. So that way those who are meditating may continue to do so. Luke chapter 22, verses 39 through 53. Jesus left and made his way to the Mount of Olives as was his custom, and the disciples followed him. When he arrived, he said to them, Pray that you won't give in to temptation. He withdrew from them about a stone's throw, knelt down, and prayed. He said, Father, if it's your will, take this cup of suffering away from me. However, not my will, but your will must be done. Then an heavenly angel appeared to him and strengthened him. He was in anguish and prayed even more earnestly. His sweat became like drops of blood falling on the ground. When he got up from praying, he went to the disciples. He found them asleep, overcome by grief. He said to them, why are you sleeping? Get up and pray so that you won't give in to temptation. 
While Jesus was still speaking, a crowd appeared, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus to kiss him. Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the human one with a kiss? When those around him recognized what was about to happen, they said, Lord, should we fight with our swords? One of them struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. Jesus responded, Stop! No more of this. He touched the slave's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come to get him, Have you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? as though I were a thief? Day after day I was with you in the temple, but you didn't arrest me. But this is your time when darkness rules. <laughs> 